Welcome to the FMCG Guys, the podcast that dives into the innovation, strategy, and trends shaping consumer goods and retail in Europe and beyond. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the FMCG Guys. Uh, this time again, live from Barcelona. So if you're listening to this podcast, which is uh, the most likely possibility, you have to know that you can also watch this podcast. So we'll leave the link to the YouTube video on the show notes. And if you're watching the video, nice to see you again. I'm uh, Daniel Torres, your usual co-host, uh, director at Dwyer Partners Executive Search. And since 2022, uh, proud co-host and founder of the FMCG Guys podcast, where we speak uh, weekly, bi-weekly actually, with experts of retail and consumer goods in Europe and beyond um, in Europe. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now I don't know what I was going to say. Anyway, one of the <laughs> experts in retail that we have in our network we have here today in Barcelona. It's Nicholas Kruger. Thanks, Nicholas, for joining us. How are you? Thanks for having us. I'm quite. I'm quite well. Like, uh, like given given the fact I got up at. 4.30 this morning to I make know. it here. Actually, I, I feel quite awake. It's good. I know. Normally, that's the time I go to sleep at. Yes. If, if, if even. If yes. even. <laughs> so, so Nicholas, I'll, I'll steal the word from you and say to our audience a little bit about you. Your, I would say, you probably can't say that, but you're a retail expert. I know that you've worked both in the industry and in the consulting side. We actually made that Shop Talk. Remember that? We did, yes. Uh, Shop Talk Vegas. So that was a fun encounter. Um, it's stranger we didn't go out at night together, actually, as a matter of fact. We'll have to leave that for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> we do. It's, it's going to be in March. You should exactly. come. Exactly. Maybe yeah. there'll be a live event coming with us uh, together. Um, and currently, he is the interim chief digital officer at uh, Manor AG, which is uh, Switzerland's largest department store, right? Yeah, it's a department store. It's the department store chain in in Switzerland. Got uh, fifty nine department stores all over Switzerland, which for that small country actually means a lot. It's a lot of department. Uh, yeah, stores. and I was asked to fill in um, for a couple of months as their chief digital officer. So that's what what I'm doing right now. Which you've re very recently kicked off. Yes. The... Yeah. Well, it's it's been a week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Um, so maybe Nicholas, you can tell us a bit about your your career background. Um, how you ended up being a uh, retail expert with a twist of digital in there as well. <laughs> yes, well, I've, I have a very colorful background. So, <laughs> you do, uh, you do. People who know me uh, know that I actually, I've, I've been an opera singer back in the days, so I've got a creative background. I also have been a photographer, so there's, uh, there's more to it than that. But I actually had a career as an opera singer. I was singing at the State Opera of Hanover for a couple of years as a soloist. But uh, that shouldn't distract us now. Um, at no, the no, same... <laughs> so, well, how, I... how long were you doing opera? Well, I, I, it's my degree. So I studied it at university. There's a, a special form of conservatory in Germany. It's called the Music University. So you uh -huh. get a university de degree, but it's also an, uh, an education to bring you on stage. Um, I studied that for a couple of years, and then uh, I sang for roughly, for, like my professional career was roughly four years, uh -huh. I would say. Wow. And you combine that with like some type of business, or was it like full time opera singing? Well, yes, again, like I, I chose a second. Uh, like, as an opera singer, you're you're basically supposed to have a second a second idea, a plan B, uh -huh. basically. So, like my, what what football players should do, and they yes, don't. Yes, yeah, yeah. So my plan B was very smart. I wanted to become a photographer, which is also like a job that's like super easy to earn money in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so I, I got trained to be a photographer, and I started my business very early on. I was only like 21, 22 years old, um, and and I sold um, headshots to artists, which worked quite well. So I, I worked for some magazines in the end, like wow. classical music magazines and for, art, for larger artists. And I did their headshots um, and I started shooting fashion. Um, and that actually brought me to my business career, which was happening at the same time. So when I was 22 years old, um, I joined a startup um, that was at that point starting to sell luxury fashion. So you did a lot, sorry, you did yeah. a lot before you were 22. Yes. Wow. No, like I, I was still a student actually. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I, yeah. I had trained to become a photographer. I was still a student of opera and I joined that startup that had just begun to sell luxury fashion, second season, second hand online on eBay, uh -huh. which at that time was sort of like the dark web type. Like yeah. nobody was selling that stuff on eBay. Mm. 
And I built that startup with them while I was still a student. So I actually had two careers at the same time. When I was at the Opera House, I was working full time as a manager in that company that at that point had grown. Um, it had become sort of like a specialized service provider for fashion brands, integrating them on various platforms, digital platforms online in a full service model. So we yeah. would do the logistics, we would do the, the customer service, the product data, everything for them. Um, that's what that's what I did. And then, well, after a couple of years I, uh, at the opera, I decided I wanted to earn money because it's uh, it's a challenging job if you want to have a family, if you want to have a car, a nice apartment. So I decided to follow the business path and I um, founded a small subsidiary for that company in the US. And afterwards, uh, well, we parted ways and I got into strategy consulting. Um, company called RCP. Um, I did e-commerce, digital commerce, omni-channel commerce, setups for the largest retail and consumer goods companies all over Europe. Um, became a partner there pretty quickly. And uh, well, I, um, I left the firm last year and now I'm on the market as an independent advisor slash like freelance consultant basically. But uh, that didn't take long. Uh, I got a call from the CEO of Manor. He asked me to fill in and now I'm, I'm there leading the digital business of that department uh, department store chain. That That's me in a nutshell. Yeah, very I know. Quick. I was very excited on you becoming a, a f not a freelancer, but a, a, a consultant like yeah. me, but it hasn't lasted long. So. Yes. <laughs> but it's it's an interim role, so it's I'll be I'll be back. Role. So maybe you'll be back, I would say, because <laughs> there's no there's no guarantee of that. So, what 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 led you to like go solo and like what what expertise are you leaning in and and maybe you can tell us a bit about more what you're doing at Manor again now. Well, I mean, my expertise, I've, I've like uh, at RCP and also before I've, I've done digital commerce, I've done marketplaces in all kinds of forms. So I've, I've worked with, again, the largest retail and consumer goods organizations all over Europe. Uh -huh. I've seen it from a strategic standpoint. I've did, I did technology projects. I did growth strategy projects. That's basically what I, what I've learned to do. I was an interim CDO also during my time as a consultant, uh, twice actually. Um, so I, I, I sort of know the drill and coming from an operational background, I did all those things myself. So back in the days, it was a startup that I started in. So everyone had to do everything themselves. I had to pack like the, I had to pack the parcels. Yeah. I had to click and, uh, do the bidding campaigns on Google, on Google marketing. So in the end it was, um, it was a hands-on training and later on a strategic training. And now I think I'm. I decided that I'm in a very well at a, at a more senior stage of my life. Yeah. So I wanted to just give that expertise to other yeah to other companies on the market. Maybe also uh, widening my focus a little bit. Right now I'm looking um, into grocery a lot because there is some very interesting developments in grocery and FMCG. Um, But again, yes. Uh, then Mano called, and now I'm back in my in my center of expertise, <laughs> which is digital retail. Yeah. Well, there's um, a lot of a lot of our audiences from the grocery FMCG space. Just so you know. So <laughs> so listen in. Well. Hi everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This is Nicholas for you. Um, so so Nicholas, let's talk about retail. So obviously, there's a lot of factors that have like. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can start with a bit of the evolution since the pandemic, like maybe where retail was when the pandemic hit and how it evolved during the pandemic. And then maybe we can go into the current scenario. So maybe let's zoom back four years into... <laughs> I know it seems ancient, doesn't it? No, I think it's also it's it's quite valid because if you look at what retail has gone through in the past four years, it's yeah. sort of like a it's so radical. It's it's hard to also remember it sometimes. It's I think it's very you have to actually um, you have to have to take into account that every region dealt with COVID a little differently. So I think uh, from state subsidies that differed vastly between the countries to the way they in, they implemented the measures of COVID, I think there's like that there's there's a there's a very big spread. Mm -hmm. However, COVID was the worst for retail because locations closed and not many countries were as advanced digitally as they wanted to be. So in the end, it put a strain on logistics like. Um, 
B2C logistics capabilities because like all of a sudden everything that was not food retail had to be delivered or like handed over in a click and collect model. So there was yeah, logistics li- constraints. Yeah. There was the constraints that foot traffic didn't happen. There was a gigantic shift in category focus. So all of a sudden everyone like you, I, you probably remember those scenarios where bicycles weren't avail- available in the market anymore. Um, everyone was buying furniture for their homes, but no one was buying like evening gown or dresses or nice stuff to wear. So all the fashion companies were suffering badly. Or, or suits. Yes, yeah, suits. The, 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 furniture, the furniture retailers were just like, uh, they were actually super happy because they were going through the roof, um, which I would say is also um, an important part to start with talking about the development after COVID because during that time, Again, the spend was shift, or the, the, there was a spending shift across categories. Other categories were sort of uh, were soaring. Others, like then, then the classic categories that were were the ones that were doing well in digital retail, they were hitting a slump. And what happened, funny enough, is that through that whole COVID period, many of the companies adapted their planning. So they said, okay, now we actually had this big boost and the growth will continue from this level, from this plateau. And that was, I think, a grand misconception all over the market. And it, it hit the big ones and the small ones. Uh, it's not that that that, there are, that many of them actually saw it coming. But I think especially when it comes to omnichannel retail, that was among other challenges, the biggest challenge to sort of find the right balance in planning merchandise, in in understanding what to sell through what channel again. Yeah. That was that was a drastic shift. Right now, um, I think we're coming back to normal somehow. But in the end, you've seen or all of you guys have seen all the bankruptcies, all the chapter 11s that were happening. Many of the companies were, were, were sort of just overwhelmed with the let's say, unplanability, I don't know if it's a word, but anyways, but uh, we, we know what you by, mean. The, by, by retail not becoming planable or not, not, not being planable anymore. It was super interesting. People were always asking about forecasts and what should we do and what should we, what, what should we buy? What should we sell? How should we price? Yeah. But there was no way of forecasting it because then there was lockdowns, it was open up again, then there was lockdowns and nobody could predict when the next lockdown would happen. So again, I think in the past four years, retail had to reinvent itself. And in, um, especially in Europe, it's still suffering. Um, there's a lot of merchandise in the market, old merchandise, old stock that hasn't been sold during the pandemic. So there is a lot of pressure on the discount formats also um, supported or also fueled by people being insecure on the consumer side with all the crises happening, with inflation happening. So there is focus on discount right now. The mid market that was usually sort of like the strong pillar is suffering. They're, they're having a hard time. Luxury is doing a bit better. So again, even today, I think the shift or the 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 mix of channels, the mix of formats is not the same as it has been before the pandemic. And like most of the mid-market retailers are sort of, yeah, they're struggling to stay alive in a way. They all have cost challenges. They all have merchandise challenges. Yeah. They all have planning challenges. Some of them have people challenges. So it's, I think it's not, it's not an easy time yet. Who, who would you put, who would you place in the mid-market? Is that like department stores, mid-range, mid-price type of fashion retailers uh, yeah it's it's i think it's, that- i think it's all over the non food retail i mm. think food is a different ball game yeah, but yeah, in yeah. non food it is like the mid market fashion brands look at the I don't know, an international one would be the Esprit's yeah. or the Marco Polo's. Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor is yeah. like on the lower end, actually. Mm. But still, um, like the brands that were selling merchandise at a at an affordable price, mm. but people would sort of like not consider them discount. They yeah, would like, consider them a brand. Like the Gap. Yeah. As well, I mean, like even the Adidas and Nikes mm. are not having a super easy time yeah. these days. So in the end, it's really the mid, the mainstream market mm. that suffers the most because people either opt for buying something luxurious. Yeah. I, I, I treat myself to a handbag yeah, yeah, yeah. or they do discount stuff because they are right now, whether it's true or not, but the, the sentiment of the consumers is that they're in a challenged situation that they have... Um, that they haven't that they have an uncertain future maybe maybe you can put it that way hmm. and 
they, they feel inflation, especially when it comes to the lower salary brackets. It's a challenge situation, again. And I, I would say, if you say the past four years, retail is recovering, yes. And um, I would say in the US, it's recovering more strongly. Also, the consumers in the US like work differently. Like The whole culture is, is more yeah. around consumerism. Um, he, or consuming stuff is, is something that's very normal for them. Here in Europe... Most of the organizations I work with are still in trouble with their P&Ls. Yeah. Not many are doing fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at the same time as you have like lower spending, inventory problems and so on. So so inventory problems mean selling at a discount. Mm -hmm. um, lower consumer sentiment means selling less. But at the same time, you have higher costs, right? Like energy, people costs they're all going up. So, yes. so with all these elements on the table, what are, how do you see a way <laughs> forward? Um, well, I think it's, that's, that's a hard, it's a hard thing to say, but I think there's going to be a cleansing of the market. I think mm -hmm. we're, we're going to see many more bankruptcies. I think we're going to see many more companies in distress. Um, because we we can't just magically make those problems and the merchandise and all that stuff disappear. So I think what's going to happen is we will see a couple of companies failing and then we will also see a renaissance because what I don't believe is that retail is dead. People need to buy stuff and they want to buy stuff. And if you look into the US, I've just returned from the NRF in New York. Retail is investing heavily in stores again, In at least in the US. I'm mm. pretty sure it's coming up here again. And when, if a store is nice, if the people in the store are nice, you want to go shop there. That's something that we've lost a little bit over the pandemic, also because the Europeans dealt with it a little differently. But yeah, I, I think retail is coming back. But I think before that is going to be still a painful period from yeah. my perspective, at least. Yeah, also we're hearing about like layoffs, for example, mm. uh, like over the last five days, it's been a much publicized Nike layoffs, mm -hmm. which is 2% of the workforce, which seems relatively low, but Nike we're only used to hearing good news about, right? So, <laughs> Very much so. And if you combine it, it's only the very big numbers get to the press or get to get like mm -hmm. mainstream media attention. The layoffs in the tech and retail industry have been dramatic. Yeah. Like so many also of my peers, super senior people, there is a wave of layoffs that sort of, um, it happens in the dark because mm -hmm. like obviously not everyone is going to be covered by a media outlet. So there is, there is a lot happening in that space and it's, it's, it's hitting the digital talent, it's hitting, hitting senior talent. <sighs> but in the end, like, I mean, retail is making money. We're in a capitalist society and uh, if you don't earn money on the bottom line, you have to you have to do something about the cost or you have to do something about top line it's like it's it's in the end there is there is necessities that you have to deal with as a business owner so i think it's it's sort of also the logical consequence of what's happening on the market yeah 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 and tell us a bit about more a bit more about what you saw at, at nrf about it because i know that you were doing like some store to tours mm -hmm. there and so on and, and i saw an article you wrote <laughs> on linkedin about it yeah. um tell us a bit about what what you saw there and and maybe later we can delve a bit into like uh the store of the future which seems like great a big thing especially considering we were supposed to just buy online mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not happening yeah it's, i think that's that for me is um it was the biggest takeaway at least on the u.s market again mm. different market dynamics and i think it'll take a while until we are healthy again or as healthy again so that we can actually also adapt that but sort of the balance between brick and mortar and e-commerce is shifting again to be, at least I think, more healthy. So brick and mortar is sort of taking, uh, they're putting their foot down, as, uh, as the Americans say. So they are reclaiming their role in the whole customer journey. And I think rightfully so. If you look at New York retail, um, and I, I love New York, I've got friends there, so I usually i am I'm in New York twice a year. Lucky you. Um, <laughs> things mm -hmm. but I, I really love the city it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just one of the most inspiring places for me in the world and I always go since I am from the retail industry I always check out the new retail stores the new retail formats and this year is the first year where I really can see investment in stores again so there is stores that are designed in such a magnificent magnificent way there is investment in store personnel as well people 
are like you walk into a store and that's also American, but still you can see they're investing in more people. You're being addressed. The people are friendly. The people are knowledgeable about the about the merchandise in the store. Mm-hmm. It's a huge difference from going into a let's say yeah, a standard fashion store um, somewhere in 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 rural Germany. It's it's insane. It's like you can you can feel that they are sort of reinvesting in the idea of a physical retail experience, but not in the way that people were sort of like um, bullshit bingoing a couple of years ago that say we need to make retail an experience. That's true, but the core of it is retail. So basically, looking back at the core values of retail, being a good Salesperson means helping the consumer find the right product with knowledge. And sort of circling back to it, it's a super nice experience. It inspires you to buy. And even if it's 10 euros more expensive than it might be on Amazon or on a digital outlet, you stand there in front of a person who who's at least seems to be standing behind their product products mm-hmm. and advertising them and giving you help. And then in the end, you buy because it's a nice experience. And, and that's a I highly think, personalized yes. one as well. So it is experiential retail, but mm-hmm. not with like huge screens. Those happen. But it's not the screens that drive people into the stores. It's basically the, the experience of interacting with a knowledgeable person being able to touch the stuff, being able to, to have to find somebody who can explain you why it's cool or why it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's what's happening again. It, it, it made me happy because it was also, you could see the stores had more traffic again, more foot traffic. There was brands investing like in, in big flagship stores. It was cool. And to be honest, I think it's good for society in the way yes. as well that it makes, makes cities more pleasant and makes cities safer. And ultimately, it just makes cities more fun. No? So I well, agree. In a city like New York, I was there in 2021 uh, when Europeans cannot go away from Europe. Um, so I was there then and it was a bit scary um, because, you know, stores were closed, not many people, because people were working from home as well. Mm-hmm. So could, you could really see that, which working from home and working from the office is also, an, we're not going to talk about it like long today, but it's an interesting dynamic as well yeah. of post-COVID, how that's really changed. And uh, people are basically working from the office again, uh, with some exceptions. Mm-hmm. But like, there's been a big return to the office, which which may have impacted as well that bit return to retail. I don't know. Well, like I mean, in Manhattan, definitely. But yeah. uh, to be fair, it's it's not back to pre-COVID levels. Mm. But you can see the Soho area is like the meatpacking, like the, all those districts that are yeah. all these all these areas in New York that are classic retail destinations. They have caught up in foot traffic. They yeah. have caught up in formats, and you can feel there is an energy also from the shopper side. Mm. They want to spend money in a fun way. It's sort yeah. of like engaging. It's a social way. Yeah. While online is not going to die. I mean, it's a very convenient way, way of getting stuff, and I think it's just sort of extending reach is the question. And how do basically reach consumers on all channels mm. without having this classic or the, 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 let's say the past perception that everything is going to be online. I think it's it's finding a balance again. I think that's healthy and good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think that European retail will follow these steps or do you, do you, are you already seeing it happen? I think European retail isn't a thing, to be honest. <laughs> um, I think... Most likely, yes. I think in the larger nation, like now, and I would say actually everywhere, this trend makes sense because we as people, we're, we're social beings. And if somebody offers me a nice experience, uh, basically, if, if I have somebody that can help me find the right product, I will accept that. And I'm pretty sure other people will too. And I can see it. Uh, how I, like I can see it when when I when I when I walk through city centers, stores that invest in that they're more successful. Stores mm-hmm. that have good store representatives that are good at communicating with consumers they're more they're more successful. And I think that is coming back. And I think there there is going to be an investment in people. Mm-hmm. When and how this is happening, and whether this is something that will be limited to the metropolitan areas first. That's, I think that's a different ball game because also where do people invest? It's probably not going to be the rural mall somewhere in the middle of nowhere. The first, yeah, the first place places they will spend that money on will be the big cities, yeah. will be the metropolitan areas. But I think there is going to be a recovery, and I think they're going to invest in the same things. First of all, those trends from the U.S. usually come over here a couple of years after, anyways. But also in this case, <clears throat> sorry, in this case, I really believe there is a justification that goes beyond 
um, beyond capitalism. It's our it's our need to interact socially. It's our need to have people who explain stuff to mm-hmm. us. It's our need to sort of also physically and socially interact with other consumers in a retail setting. I think it's going to come back here as well. Mm-hmm. And what about, so we, we talked about with a, on a podcast recently with a guy called David Puke mm-hmm. from uh, Active Brand. So that's an outdoors um, that's our outdoors um, garments and so on. But we talked about like the split about um, re- big retail chains like department stores, on online or direct to consumers and own stores, and independent retailers like more like specialty local retailers. How do you see that split of the three evolve? Because w- the the thought was a few years ago, independent stores with mom and pop stores were disappearing. Mm-hmm. Then the thought was everything will be or DTC or online, and now we're back to big fashion brands going to retailers and also we like chain retailers and we're also hearing a lot about independent stores doing well and some brands actually entering the market through these independent stores. So how do you see that dynamic evolving and do you think it's relevant as well? Well, I think maybe it's um, it's just it's just a moment where we can cut the drama a little bit. <laughs> um, whenever somebody says tomorrow everything's going to be online or tomorrow everything's going to be D two C, suspect take take away thirty yeah, percent. Of yeah. course, there's developments, and I think, for example, if you look into multi brand retail, I think the function in the in uh, the classic value chain has has changed a little bit so the value add of multi brand retail is still i can actually give a consumer selection so i can offer him a dress shirt not only by one brand but both three by three brands so the consumer can see okay this one fits me better and maybe this pants brand uh, works well because in most cases most of the brands don't have full outfits so people will combine so the multi brand offering is something people want or consumers want so it's always going to be there i think what is changing and that is that is changing also from a from a from an economical perspective is the um the model in which brands collaborate with these multi-brand formats is changing rapidly so many of the multi-category multi-brand retailers i know are shifting their own by stock towards concession and consignment models. So basically the D2C development, a brand is directly manufacturing and directly selling to the consumer is sort of happening on the floors of those multi-brand concepts because the merchandise is not owned by the by the retailer, it's owned by the brand. So this is this is a trend that has like it has many reasons it's working capital management for the retailers it's also the brands wanting to control the complete um, experience towards the consumers it's about consumer data as well but this trend is is still active and still heavy and i think that sort of changes the function of multi-brand retail a little bit but i believe also there there's going to be a balance of course, the mom and pop shops will still be there. I think they just need to adapt like every every other place also needs to adapt. They need to find their niche. They need to find their their consumer good they address. Like in New York right now, community is a super big topic in retail. And I think it's very valid. So the smaller stores say we only thrive, we only survive because we build a footprint within or we make a footprint within our local community. So like in a, in a circle of, I don't know, two miles around our store, people know about us and people return to us because they know we're sort of also reliable and we're sort of like a local point of contact for them for a certain, I don't know, in this case, I, I was talking to the owner of a fashion, uh, fashion store, independent fashion boutique, um, hipster stuff. But he said, well, the people here know us, the people come here, the people know that they'll pay maybe a little bit more. But also we've been around here for 10 years. The consumers come back and back and back and they build a relationship to us. I think that's sort of the part that's super important for Mm -hmm. the small ones. And even the bigger ones, they're investing so much in building community. How do you make how do you make consumers loyal? How do you make them come back to you? And it's not just price and it's not just assortment. That's one way to go. But like, to be honest, that game has been won by the Walmarts and Amazons of this world. They have like billions of products on their side. So I think the assortment came, it's that you win, you won't win loyalty yeah. with that. So you have to find your own way of building your community. And that goes very strongly for the small stores. I think the balance is different. I think people need to still adapt and the adaption speed 
has increased a lot. I don't know how you how you see it, but like for me, the in, the, the speed at which retailers have to reinvent themselves has increased drastically. We just need to uh, monitor developments very quickly. We need to be fast. Our time to market needs to be fast. Our lead times need to be fast. Our way we work with technology needs to be adaptive, modular, so that we can exchange or replace a module, um, go live on a new channel, go live on a new social media channel. So we have to actually be much faster yeah. than before. That's why it's like fascinating how planning cycles, which are like 12, 18 months out, can work in such a like fast-changing world. No, it's like... I, I think it's. I mean, it's the biggest challenge, isn't it? Like, if if you don't know what's going to happen in 12 months, but you still have to order your 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 winter collection a year ahead, um, how do you do that? I think that's that's a challenge. Also, there's there's a development there where more and more retailers go into like sort of replenishment models, so they don't order the full quantity ahead. They just uh, they they they. Um, draw more assortment as the one on the shop floor is sold. However, that also puts a strain on the brands again. So uh, if I am a brand, I have to sort of like be much more flexible in my delivery models. I have to have bigger stock maybe that will increase my working capital risk. It's, it's, it's not an easy question or an easy, uh, not an easy topic. I think that that whole supply chain strain and the whole working with supply chain is something that will very much define winners and losers in the future. Mm. If you have that under control, it's much easier for you to make money in retail these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, can AI, for example, help bridge that? I think, yeah, like, uh, I think when we talked before, you, you had one line that said, cutting through the noise as a leader. I think one of the biggest noise creators or one of the biggest sources of noise right now is the word AI. Um, people use it like they use AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence is like the same. It's not. There's many different forms. There's many different ideas of what we're trying to do. But in the end, it's just everyone is talking about it since ChatGPT has been launched and everyone thinks, okay, that's a real thing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is huge opportunity in it. But funny enough, like if you talk to most of retailers and to most companies, I'm pretty sure it's, it's the same in grocery not many have adopted it in a way that it actually generates positive impact on their P&L, but it will. There is a couple of, uh, a, a couple of um, areas, one of which is supply chain. The whole product lifecycle management, um, planning, forecasting, it's going to be heavily impacted by it. And I've seen use cases that are super cool because mm -hmm. they get more granular, they get more adaptive, and you're just getting faster. And being faster... In this in this market environment is basically meaning making more money. Same goes for customer interaction in terms of service interaction. So if you want to know where your parcel is, you don't understand the tracking, you want a refund, you want to discuss that there is like a broken part in the electronic you just bought. That's something that AI can help with easily and it's helping with it already. Product data, master data, super diff difficult topic in the past, um, like topic that usually had massive uh, invest in terms of personnel hours. That can, can, there's use cases that make that much quicker, much faster, much more reliable. And there is like already now in, in the whole AI space, there is a lot of things that can help retailers, but you need to sort of package it right. Uh, it's not, there's not this one solution. There's not this one model that yeah. you can use. I think you just have to find the right use cases and package them right. And, and um, did you see that uh, ChatGPT, well, the company behind them, have just uh, announced that they're launching a video a video Sora, yes. yeah, Sora. Do you think, like when, when I see that, it makes me think of like a dystopian future type of thing. But I don't know if it's just like something that's more like a toy or it will actually be help, it will actually be useful. Let me give you uh, an answer from my history as a photographer. When I was starting to become a photographer, digital photography was in its infancy. So the cameras had like three megapixels, five megapixels. Wow. And for most use cases, that wasn't enough. So people were feeling threatened by it, but they would say, well, analog photography will prevail because this is not good enough for printing it on a large magazine page because mm. the resolution is not high enough. Today, I don't know a lot of photographers outside the fine art world that yeah. photograph analog. Why? Because this tool that we've 
that we that we that we got is so much more convenient. It's so much faster. You can delete. You don't have to develop film. It's so much faster and quicker. So everyone adopted it. This is a tool. I think the dystopian future. There's always a way to to interpret it in a way that uh, tomorrow there is going to be videos of all of us doing stuff that we don't want to be seen in. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure we're going to find solutions. I'm talking to a um, to a company called Poap. I think they're doing like. Um, Proof of authenticated particip particip participation or something like uh -huh. that. Um, I'm actually talking to them in uh, in a couple of weeks, and what they are doing is they're sort of like um, putting a a um, an NFT in your account, saying it's really you on this video, or it's really you who participated. So I think there is solutions around that uh, whole threat around like a threat of fake fake images of you, which will going to be easy to create. But in the end, it's just a tool. It's a great tool. If you look at the results of Sora, it's insane what it can do from a text prompt. So basically for mass marketing, for all kinds of like uh, sort of uh, reach plays, this is an insane tool. I've seen AI tools that basically do, they, they take in a 3D model or one picture of a handbag and then they create various surroundings for it and they put it into different backgrounds. Imagine stuff like that. You have just your one handbag model, you feed it to that uh, video generation engine and then you say, you okay, I want five thing. different models like holding this handbag. Yeah. It's crazy. It's a really great tool. But if you also look at the limitations, it's not going to overwhelm us tomorrow. It's going to be much quicker than innovation cycles in the past. Mm -hmm. The development is really fast, mm -hmm. but still there is limitations, there is issues with it. Just use it as a tool. Adopt it as we did digital photography, as we adopted the CD. Who knows the CD? <laughs> I know the CD. Um, as we adopted the DVD and then came into streaming. I think it's, it's, it's a new tool set. We just have to learn how to use it. And then we also, of course, have to address the threats that lie yeah. within it. But yeah, I think yeah, there's yeah. options. Again, as I said, I think there's going to be developments around mm -hmm. that. Um, by the way, well, regarding the when we were talking about brands and so on and DTC, you mentioned that a lot of multi-brands will... A moving brands towards concessions and mm -hmm. and and what's called more the the three P model, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there you said that it was not only retailers pushing the brands, but also brands wanting to be there to control more their own space, the data, yeah. and so on. How do you see that evolving? Because I know that because that basically means that brands have to be more DTC ready in terms of their operations, no? Yeah, it's a, I think it's a big challenge, to yeah, be honest, no? because many brands have They're learned the ready. B2B model. They yeah. have learned to ship a pallet and they haven't learned to ship a single item yeah. or to replenish a store um, yeah. or, or or their their little area in the store. It's it's learning processes. And it's, it's also understanding pricing in a new dimension because you sort of have to do end user pricing in different locations, which means I might actually want to mark down one product in one location, but I won't in another. Hmm. So... It's learning a new skill set, which can be beneficial, um, but it's definitely not an easy task. I think many of those brands need help. Still, the market is going in that direction and has been for quite a while now. So many of the many of the vertical brands know their game anyways. So if they have their own stores, I think that that helps. And the ones that were historically B two B only, they just will have to adapt to the market. It's a need of the market as well. Because if I'm a retailer and I'm in the full capital risk, and with every intermediary in the whole chain, mm -hmm. a bit of the margin get, gets lost. And in a way, it makes sense that the capital capital risk is more on the brand side because they have the full margin. They have to incorporate it into their business model with the retailer. So I think that's that's a different way of calculating it. But in the in, in, in a way, it makes more sense to have the capital risk there than having it at the retailer side. But well, that's also it's it's basic economy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think there's there's a mix of challenges. It's understanding whether a B2, D2C model makes sense like in full scope or whether it's just the way the merchandise is being sold. There is like also varying levels of intensity when it comes to these to these scenarios. Well, I think it's probably like part of all these moving pieces where, which ultimately will find like some type of like adjustment, no? Yes. Kind of, because things are never like a hundred percent adjusted, and there's always things that are moving. Um, isn't it, like if if I ask hmm. you, isn't it like for me? I would say we live in a time of rapid uh, rapid adapt adaptation needs. So we just need to be extremely fast. We yeah. didn't. We need. We need to be very agile, understanding market developments and being open 
to change our business model, change our ideas, change our data, change the way we market quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I think that is what I perceive this time to be. It's it's very it's very it need, we need to be fast, agile, and open, and we need to have a like even more than before. We we need to have a culture of continuous learning. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, the market changes too fast and we're just like, going to be old and out of the market quite soon. Uh, <laughs> we don't want that to happen, do we? Like the thing of like things have always worked this way here. Well, I think it was always very toxic and will never work. But especially now, no, mm -hmm. that that won't work like that. <laughs> um, what about like understanding the consumer with tech? So, but I think that understanding your consumer is probably the most important thing when you have a brand. How can uh, tech bridge that? I don't know if you learned anything about that in the NRF, but like, I know, in-store tech, loyalty, personalization. I think there's a couple of things. Uh, first, first of all, I, I come from the digital space and there understanding your consumer is much, much easier than offline or in a brick and mortar environment because we have all the data available. So like, that's been a game of the e-com uh, management uh, forever. We want to understand where the consumer goes on our side, what uh, what kind of buttons they click. We have been optimizing that for a long time, and mm -hmm. we've been collecting data. I think that's sort of that's sort of an easy answer. When it comes to the store, I think it's been it's been a bit more challenging. There's all uh, there's been all that kind of in store tech where you can measure foot traffic, where you can I measure. I saw a picture of you in a mirror. With some like yeah. trains and clothes on in the mirror. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the magic mirror, it's still not dead. Anyways, um, <laughs> the, like I would say there in, in this space, AI has a big impact because this in store tech had one issue. It usually could count people. Yeah. And if you would involve a camera, there's like all kinds of GDPR, mm. data protection stuff. Now, through machine learning and AI, the camera can actually they can sort of recognize individual consumers. However, they're not going to be recognized. They're going to be anonymized or pseudonymized immediately. And through using just simple cameras and image recognition, this tech has become more advanced, much quicker and more affordable. Because in the past, to create a, uh, a solution where you can actually track consumer behavior in a store anonymously was very expensive. And now with like its basic cameras and it's just image recognition, it gets much more advanced and more affordable. So I, I, I think we will see a lot more adoption of in-store tech even for smaller stores because it's, it's getting cheaper and it's very valuable. You understand it's fraud prevention. Like there's a big wave of shoplifting, of, 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 of fraud and shoplifting in the US but also in the UK. Mm. So you can understand by the behavior of the person, is he about to steal something? You can, um, like if you have a self-checkout -check system, like some of the stores are actually taking them back they're, they're rolling it back. They're not having them in the stores anymore because people were stealing too much. But now these systems have like sort of cameras that recognize when somebody is trying to, to steal something. There's a lot of advancement in that sector. And I think we're going to see much more adoption of it because there's use cases uh, for it for any store size, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The store step thing is interesting. Is there a correlation between speaking English and getting more robberies in your store since it's the US and the UK that are having that issue? I don't know. Like the UK, it's also new for me, but they have like a lot of, um, like there's a wave of aggression as well. So like there's like, there's, there's been, there's been um, fights with store people. Mm. There's like, uh, I've, I read an article, I think two days ago, where it says like the, like um, violence against store employees has skyrocketed. Wow. And in the US, um, it's, I think it's a pandemic situation, or it's it's uh, it's become more prevalent in the pandemic because people in the U.S. understanding and understanding the U.S. from a perspective of I have friends there, I understand their social security system, and it basically doesn't exist in the way we know it. Mm -hmm. So many people, for many people, it was simply a necessity. So people would st uh, would steal out of a necessity, and then in the city centers, in the downtowns, in many downtowns. Foot traffic has gone down. You described New York as eerie, as scary, and that's the same for many of the metropolitans in well, the US. Well, in Seattle. Yeah. Horrendous. So, um, especially those uh, pharmacy chains, like now in those ph pharmacy CVSs, mm -hmm. they have everything caged. Yeah. Like even if you buy in New York, sometimes even if you buy a Coke, a yeah. can of Coke, you have wow. to, somebody have, has to unlock it. Wow. It's kind of crazy. Wow. I don't know the real reason for it. I actually have to look into it. Yeah. More to, yeah, definitely. Um, quick one, uh, regarding like leadership in companies, which is super important. We talked about layoffs, but I think that we'll also see 
some degree of churn and like sea level. How do you see that evolving like in this new scenery and retail that we're going to like? And also we can see like organizational changes. Um, where, we will. Will e- where will e-commerce sit, for example? We will, we will see a lot of organizational changes. And I think it's going to be a challenging time because what we're seeing in technological development will make many um, repetitive tasks obsolete. So many of the things that now have, have to be done by humans will mm-hmm. not be done by humans. And while I am convinced that there is new tasks that will come up that will sort of need a human touch, so basically either sorting through the recommendations that mm-hmm. uh, um, a large language model gives you or um, maybe even investing more time spending with your to spend with your consumer, I do believe that the technological de- the technological development that we're going through right now is driving efficient efficiency, which mm-hmm. means many of the roles will not be needed in the current form. And yes, there's going to be a balance. Some some of the roles will just change and you have sort of a different focus, maybe even a better focus because you actually can do more content things instead of doing repetitive tasks. But I think it's going to be a challenging phase for all of us yeah. because those tasks we've been trained to do, like all those office tasks, many of them can be done very well by a machine and will be, like the, the machines are getting better by the minute, so the, many of those tasks will be automated in the future. So I think there's going to be a massive change in work in workforce. Right now, where I don't really see it is um, in-store. So replacing the, the store associate is not something that we're going to see tomorrow because I've seen the robotic, like the state of robotic. Mm-hmm. I've looked at a couple of like uh, humanoid robots and also like store assisting robots. We even visited a store in New York. It's called the Bot Bar where there's a, a, a robot as a barista that serves yeah. you coffee, but it's gimmicky and it's not replacing humans. On the contrary, it always makes mistakes and then somebody has to come and help him. So in the end... So it's more like a gimmick. It's a gimmick and which it's nice. In, which is fun as well. It's interaction yeah. and it's cool and it's, it's, it's an experience, but it's not going to replace the it's store associate. To, yeah. Second part that's not going to be replaced anytime soon is logistics, Yeah, especially yeah, yeah, B2C. Yeah. The warehouse is highly automated now, but like when it comes to delivery, when it comes to moving merchandise, I think there also we, we won't see that shift as drastically. When you look at data, when you even look at like low level coding, uh-huh. many of these models can now um, deliver perfect program code so yeah. you have you tell it what what it what the program needs to do and then it delivers a code that works so for many programmers for many IT people it's also going to be a shift in how do I how do I work with it well they need to be retrained yeah or they need to retrain yeah. themselves um and what about c level like like ceos chief commercial officers and so on do you think that there'll be a change of the type of profile there that's a that's a very broad question. I think um, depending on the format, we will uh, we will see the CI slash CT slash CDO roles gain importance. I think they will actually gain traction in their organizations because they are the ones that provide the technology that then helps other mm-hmm. people decide. I think for the decision makers, I'm not sure whether the profile will change drastically because what they will get is maybe more information and easier selection of um, of possible options for their decision. So they will be helped by technology. However, they will still have to decide. So they will maybe have to learn how to work with data that is being fed to them. Mm-hmm. But I don't see an imminent change. As for the COOs, of course, like in the moment, the moment that some tasks are getting less personnel intensive and are done by by technology, I think they actually have to understand more, understand better how that actually is going to be integrated into their mm-hmm. organization. I I see the biggest I, for me what I predict, but that's also well, who knows? We we all predicted a lot of things that didn't happen in the past four years. But I think the 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 people in charge of technology will have an important role because they are the ones that basically supply the data that is then used as a basis for decisions by the uh, by let's say the rest of the C suite. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah that's a good point. Um one one last one. Um with everything that you've learned during your career, if you had to go back to the beginning of it, uh what advice would you give yourself with everything that you've learned? Smile. 
smile, become, listen and learn. It's what I've like, my career has been a very wild ride, but I don't regret any of it. I've I've done the coolest stuff. I've I stood on like stages in like one of the biggest opera houses in the world as a soloist. I've been I've I've dealt with the biggest retail companies all over Europe with their C-suite. I've learned so much from these people. I'm very grateful for it. I would say the one thing that I would tell myself is just be calm, listen, don't take your tell don't don't take yourself too seriously. Don't think you know anything. Just listen, learn, and then adapt and use your brain to sort of build your opinion in the moment. But never be arrogant. Never think you're better. Never think you're done. Well, that comes from a very smart person like you, Nicholas. So that's a lot. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in or watching us. Uh, it was great to sit here with Nicholas. I learned a lot, have a lot of takeaways. So I hope you do too. And we'll see you in the next episode of the FMCG, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.